pleasure to introduce everybody today to our panelist, Steve George. He's COO here at WeFurks. There's a quick bio on him as well, if you want to take a moment to read. And then we will take it over with Steve, please. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, OK, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, accelerating software delivery. Uh, so first of all, just a little bit of information about WeFurks, if you don't know us uh, or you haven't come to one of these talks before. Uh, so basically there's sort of three things that uh, inform the way that we uh, deal with Kubernetes um, and those three things are that essentially as a company what we do is help teams to deliver Kubernetes by using GitOps and we help teams to build their platforms and operate their platforms. Um, the three areas that we work in a lot are we do quite a lot of work in open source and um, we have certain key projects like EKS, Cuttle, uh, Flux and Flagger and today I'm going to be talking about Flux and Flagger a little bit uh, when we talk about um, application delivery on Kubernetes. We do a lot of um, services for customers uh, helping um, teams to build their application delivery capability or build their Kubernetes applications um, or even their clusters and how they deploy and operate those clusters. Uh, so a lot of our experiences go into our open source projects and our sort of our way of working. Um, and then our commercial product is something called Weave Kubernetes Platform, uh, which is a platform that is designed to help teams uh, operate hundreds of clusters with GitOps. Um, you know, it's for cloud or on-premise. We generally work with quite large enterprises who are deploying, you know, very large numbers of clusters or very large numbers of applications on those clusters. Um, and the sort of thing that holds everything together is something we call GitOps. And I'm going to be talking about GitOps and the way that it helps us build an operating model for Kubernetes. And specifically today, I'll be talking about how it applies to applications. Uh, so digging in on the open source front, you'll see that there's sort of three areas that we work on um, and those, and I'm going to touch on uh, a number of those areas today. So our sort of core expertise is in Kubernetes itself. Um, and this uh, set of webinars is really around AWS and the enabling technologies around AWS and cloud native on an AWS uh, front. Uh, and there our sort of main project is something called EKS Cuttle, uh, which is the official EKS uh, CLR. Um, so if you haven't, if, um, I think in some of the earlier webinars and in the introduction to GitOps, we talk a lot about EKS Cuttle and how to use that uh, to build clusters. And then we have a lot of work in observability and what we're thinking about in observability is being able to uh, manage and operate those applications to understand what the applications are doing on the Kubernetes cluster. So you can imagine a circumstance where you've got, you know, many different teams managing many different microservices set up on a cluster or clusters. Um, and then thinking about the observability aspects of that so that you can understand troubleshoot and so forth. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But mostly today I'm going to be um, focused on CD, uh, continuous delivery and the GitOps tooling around that. Um, and in particular, uh, two projects that I'll be introducing you to. Uh, one is called Flux, which is a sort of Kubernetes native continuous delivery tool. Um, and then the other one I'll be talking a little bit about is Flagger, uh, which is um, an open source uh, library, which helps if you're using meshes of any uh, um, any type. Uh, so if you're using a service mesh like app mesh on AWS and you want to do continuous delivery, um, I'll be talking a little bit about Flagger and how you can bring that into your mix. Uh, so in terms of how we as a company operate um, and how we work with customers, so um, this is sort of um, where our expertise is coming from. So essentially we do a full service for customers where we help to educate and design Kubernetes based platforms for them. And then we build out our platform, which is both Kubernetes, but the important part on the right and where I'll be talking mostly today is a set of technologies that help developers and SREs to deliver their applications on a, on a Kubernetes based platform. Um, so really the purpose of this slide in terms of um, this particular talk is that we have expert expertise across the whole range um, of people who are building their platforms or operating their platforms at different stages in their life cycle. And we try and apply those lessons in the open source technologies and in the ways that we work with customers. Uh, so in this series, um, we've been talking about the fact that many enterprises choose Kubernetes for, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so in this particular one, I'm going to be focusing on developer productivity um, and specifically the continuous delivery part of that. 
um, sort of as a proof of the pudding here, as proof that uh, GitOps really works. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit right at the beginning about Metal, which is a company um, uh, based on uh, NatWest that has been successfully using these technologies uh, on a Kubernetes uh, platform. Um, so we actually did a webinar, I think, two weeks ago where um, Steve Wade came along and he's their head of their platform. Um, and uh, talk through kind of some of the elements that they've been using. So they use Concourse CI uh, to do their CI. Um, and then they've started using Flux. They use AWS extensively um, to build out their platform. And these are some of the figures that they've been seeing. So increasing their deployment speed by 50%, um, increasing their deployment frequency by 65%. So getting all of those changes out in a much more iterative fashion and that in turn then has meant that the team can focus uh, on much higher value capabilities, much higher value uh, areas of work rather than automating, you know, a lot of the releases um, that they've had to do in the past. Um, so if you look at this as kind of um, a lesson about how to use GitOps, what I'm going to try and do today is sort of dig into some of the specific technologies that they work. But I really encourage you to listen to Steve's webinar. Uh, we did it a few weeks ago and it's uh, uh, available on demand. So definitely worth uh, listening to. Um, okay, so focus area for today is accelerating delivery. Um, so we're talking about Amazon in this uh, setup and most of the situations that we're uh, thinking about here are Amazon EKS. And then uh, in with Amazon EKS, we um, build a GitOps layer. Um, and I'm going to dig into GitOps a little bit more and what the principles are of it. But fundamentally, the sort of specific areas of technology I'll be talking about is Git as a configuration management capability when you're operating Kubernetes itself, uh, continuous delivery um, and why that's really useful uh, and how to operate that using GitOps, and then observability um, as a part of that. And I'm going to specifically talk about progressive delivery today. So using App Mesh um, and um, Flagger as a way of doing progressive delivery to increase the speed that you do, do deployments, but also increasing the reliability. All right, so let's start with GitOps. Uh, if you've ever been to a WeaveWorks talk, you know we always talk about GitOps um, and, and, why imp and how important it is. It's sort of the base approach that we have to everything that we do. Um, it's based on kind of two um, core insights. So um, we've worked as the company. Originally, we um, built something called Weave Cloud, which uh, is a big SaaS product, um, predominantly aimed at helping SREs and application developers um, operate their applications in the cloud. Um, and for, in order for us to do that, we had to build our own Kubernetes-based platform um, and operate that platform and deploy new versions of our code um, so that our customers could get hold of that. Um, and one of the things that we realized, one of the benefits about using um, Kubernetes is that it is declarative, that it is a model driven system. Um, and that really helped us in terms of how we deploy and how we look after applications through the whole of the life cycle. Um, because in a declarative system, we can describe exactly what we want um, and then leave the system to do that work for us. Uh, and it will figure out the specific details about where to put nodes, you know, well, sorry, where to put pods on nodes and how to deploy things for us. Um, so really the important point here is that with a declarative system, you can move up um, another uh, layer of abstractions, shall we say, and rather than imperatively needing to tell specific applications to be loaded onto specific nodes, we can use Kubernetes and the, Q and the capabilities around Kubernetes to have this higher order understanding about exactly what we want and they then leave the details of the system uh, you know, to the system itself. So you get a much more autonomic uh, base system for managing. And then the other insight from us that we saw, which, you know, um, if for anybody who's run a large distributed system is sort of um, quite obvious, but, you know, it's something that we talk about all the time, which is that observability brings control. So if you're going to have a declarative based system, which is a slightly higher order than some of the imperative systems out there, then by definition, you have to give a degree of control over to the system because the system needs to figure out what's right for it um, and what's right for the constraints that you've applied. And one of the effects of that then will, will be that it can do things slightly differently from how 
you would have expected it to do. Um, and so what we want in this kind of system is a lot of observability and, and so that we can use that to understand exactly why the system is operating in the way that it is. Uh, we can be alerted if there's any kind of problem or issue in the way that it's delivering that to us. And then that allows us to automate and take control because if anything operates in a way differently from what we were expecting, and then we can intervene, whether that's automatically or you know, manually at that point. Um, so when we talk about GitOps, what are we thinking about? So fundamentally, GitOps is a standardized workflow for how to deploy, configure, monitor, update, and manage Kubernetes and all components, right? So really what we're saying here is that GitOps is providing, you know, a complete workflow, uh, SDLC effectively for Kubernetes and all the components that you would run on Kubernetes and how that's going to apply to what we're talking about today is we're going to be talking about, um, you know, the, the workloads um, that we're running on top of our core Kubernetes cluster. Um, so that's why, um, you know, from a developer perspective or an SRE perspective, GitOps is very much applicable. Um, now, in GitOps, we have two Git repositories. We have, um, you know, as a developer, you're thinking a, about your source code. It's in your Git re repo, um, and that's your core, uh, you know, uh, definition for your service and everything within it. But here, what we're talking about is a configuration repository. Um, so a configuration repo uh, contains declarative descriptions of all the elements cu currently designed desired in the production environment and then we use an automated process to make the production environment match the described state in the repository. Um, so we can sort of break that down in a little bit more simply. Um, so fundamentally the entire system is described declaratively. So as, as I said the core Kubernetes, any core uh, components that you want to run on your cluster and then of course the individual workloads and anything that they require. The whole of that system the whole of the desired state that you want for that system is versioned in Git. Um, so you've got complete configuration management. Um, and then you, you, you approve changes that are then can be automatically applied to the system. So there's two parts there. One is that you as the developers or you as the operators approve any changes. So you go through a normal pipeline of changes where you make sure that you're happy and comfortable with those changes. And then that change is automatically applied to the system. So that is now the new desired state. And at that point, Kubernetes kicks in and starts making those changes. The way we specifically do that is we use a software agent um, and we run that software agent within the Kubernetes cluster. So it effectively means that the Kubernetes cluster is read only because its source of truth is the canonical version, which is in Git. And it's always constantly checking to make sure that version is correct. And that gives us some other side benefits. It allows us to do things like alert if there's any change or diff from what should be running and what is running um, and make sure that we don't have any drift in the actual um, production system away from the desired state that you've said you want. Um, so here is our um, SRE or our application developer and they are configuring two things in this diagram. So on the left hand side, you've got the configuration repo. And then on the bottom left hand side, you've got the image repository, which has got the built source code, so the built container that you want to run uh, in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so those two things, the definition for the service, uh, which is in this configuration repo, and then the image repository itself um, describes everything for that individual service, that individual microservice. Um, and so that's how we ensure that the entire system is described declaratively. Um, now, for that reason, um, we know that it's versioned because we're able to use Git, we can use pull requests, we can use all of our normal tooling that we're used to with Git um, in order to take advantage of any changes that we want. So we can do commentary and all of those sorts of good things, including pull request signing. Uh, all the approved changes that we have now signed off and that we're happy with, um, those are now in the configuration repo. So that's telling us that the desired state that we want the system to be. Um, and at that point, the agent that's operating within the Kubernetes cluster will pull from the configuration repo and apply those changes. So it understands what the approved changes are that are available. 
um, and that software agent is ensuring correctness at all times, right? So this is not a one-off system. This is not a one-off, you know, uh, push that just happens at one point from outside the cluster. This is happening on a continual basis from within the cluster, constantly checking that everything is correct and there's no, uh, you know, problems. And if there are any problems, it can then alert on that divergence. Uh, so as I say, just uh, the entire system. So what we're gonna be talking about here is specifically workloads, but there are scenarios where people want to define um, cluster wide components, for example, that you want to run in every single cluster or an operations team might want to define certain things that are always available to the application operators. Um, the cluster stack itself is completely versioned. So that will include the underlying version of, e of EKS, the configuration, the setup, as well as the application itself. Um, because those changes are applied uh, automatically, this includes all the CRUD components. So it will make changes to ensure that you're fully aligned. And then the ensuring correctness part uh, is essentially ensuring that there's no divergence between those two points. Right. Uh, so why should we care? Why is GitOps useful? Why is it interesting um, for us? Well, fundamentally, it means that we can do automation uh, so that we can deploy things quickly and without human interaction. So that's really, you know, a useful um, in a variety of different circumstances. We'll talk about some of the constraints around that where you may not want to fully automate your production environment, but uh, deployments to your production environment, but you might want to automate as, as far along that pipeline as possible. Um, it gives you the, a trivial ability to do rollbacks, um, and we'll be talking a, um, about that in a bit more detail. Now, before you get to production, you can just easily do a rollback because you can just deploy a new, you know, the previous version uh, that you had operating, so the previous Git hash uh, where you had things running. Um, and then in production, we'll talk a little bit about using um, app mesh in order to make a kind of progressive uh, real rollbacks a little bit better. Uh, it gives you exceptional auditing and attribution. Um, as long as your Git repos, uh, you, know, you know, your Git process is already secure, then you know exactly who did what change at what point in time. Um, and of course, you're in introducing a new security boundary because at this point, you, you're running the agent automatically within the cluster, ensuring that the pools are from within the cluster rather than when you do it with your CI system, where the CI system has to go in and poke uh, directly onto things. Um, we're not going to talk about the policies um, elements today. This is more of a concern for flat platform teams, but it is a, you know, a way in which you can enforce a variety of um, policies uh, onto a cluster or, you know, you can ensure that um, particular things are checked for um, as part of your deployment pipeline. Uh, so what might we want to actually have under GitOps uh, when you're operating services and clusters. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a bit about pipeline and particularly um, the continuous delivery part of it. Uh, and I'm going to talk about observability a little bit um, uh, in terms of how this applies to sort of advanced forms of service mesh and using service mesh for continuous delivery. Um, but there's, you know, essentially what you want to have um, in a GitOps system is everything in which you want to operate the service, you want to keep under Git. So um, the definition for the service, um, anything that you need in order to run it, any metrics, any definitions of events and logs, you might put, uh, you know, all of your information about how you deal with things, so playbooks, anything which is needed for the service, you want to keep associated and close to the service definition so everything uh, comes together in the same way. All right, so that's sort of a quick summary of GitOps, um, and I'm just going to move forward now into talking a little bit more about continuous delivery, um, and specifically how we do continuous delivery for applications um, in a GitOps setting. Uh, so main benefits to this uh, for most teams are the fact that it makes it really fast for you to do deployments um, and it's really simple to revert back to that previous state and then from an observability perspective you get much better understanding um, and visualization of exactly what's happening because you're attaching continuous delivery and observability to each other so it makes sure that those two things are closely aligned. All right, so I said at the beginning that the main project uh, that we operate is something called FlexCD. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. So um, as a reminder, a main thing to bear in mind is that when we're thinking about this from a developer perspective, there's two uh, repositories in play when you're operating GitOps in this way. 
so the first of those is the source code. So here our application developer is developing locally, they're testing locally, and then you know they're using their normal source code repo and then their CI system to build their containers. Um, and so you have a container image, um, which is then pushed into a container registry. Um, and that can be any um, existing source code system, you know, it doesn't have to be Git, it can be whatever you want. The interface that um, our system deals with is the container registry. So no reason to change any of the existing ways of working that teams are operating in order to do this. And what we're specifically dealing with on the right hand side when we want to do deployment is a different configuration repo. So this repo has got the configuration for the individual service within it and how that service is going to operate um, within the Kubernetes execution environment. And um, so if you bear in mind that there are these two separate repos, our source code repo and our configuration repo, it becomes a lot more easy to understand what's happening. So GitOps with Flux. Um, so in this configuration repo, what do we define? Uh, what we define is all the namespaces, the deployment, the service description, everything that we need in order to you know, do a kubectl apply fundamentally for this service. Um, and then that is running in its own um, Git, um, Git cluster, sorry, its own Git repo. And then what's happening is the Flux agent, as you can see here in this diagram, it's operating in the middle and it pulls from two areas. First of all, it pulls from the cluster uh, from the Git repo for the configuration repo. Um, and then it's also pulling the Docker container. And what it does is it looks for Docker contain new versions of Docker containers or a definition that you define within the configuration repo. And then whenever it sees that new version, it will then apply that to the Kubernetes API. Um, and you can tell Flux that you're interested in you know, new, the latest container, or you can um, tell it that you want it to look for certain tags or tell it that you um, want it to look for um, you know, certain semantic versions. So there's a variety that you can tell Flux look at these containers or ignore these containers um, it's particularly useful when you are you know uh, want a complex pipeline where your dev um, uh, clusters might be using a particular semantic version compared to your prod clusters So characteristics and capability. So with this kind of capability, one of the things that immediately happens is that you now have you know, your declared state within Git. So you can use all of the normal Git tooling um, through pull requests, through commentary, in order to decide whether a change is appropriate. And this is particularly useful for your production environments. Um, but earlier on, it's also useful because people can discuss and you know, work around in their normal way in Git um, and, get, and it makes sort of a, the deployment part as straightforward as the rest of the development part. Um, you can actually use this to bootstrap clusters and drive the other cluster operations. So, uh, you know, if you think about the fact that you might want to set up uh, temporary clusters in order to test a particular version of software, um, you know, or do a complete end-to-end -end test. So because you've got the whole thing stored within Git, uh, including the EKS uh, definition, you can then use that to drive the whole of the cluster setup. Um, you're deploying those applications through a container registry. As I said, it'll work with um, essentially any container registry. So as long as you've got a container build, you, know, you work with your existing CI system, no reason to change any of that. It's completely um, uh, compatible with those normal container registries. Um, and you can use this to automate the upgrades of applications used in the cluster, because um, as soon as Flux sees a new version of a container um, that it's been told to watch for, it will then commit on your behalf back into the, into the configuration repo saying, essentially, I saw a new version of this container and I've deployed it automatically for you. So you can use this for some quite advanced scripting system, um, setups where your CI system builds, and then you might do a deployment of that new version and do a end-to-end -end setup. Um, and it also works with the Helm operator. So it works with Helm. We have a, a different project called Helm Pro, um, operator, which is part of Flux CD. Um, and then essentially what this does is it replaces Helm upgrade with Git push. Uh, and I'll show you that in a little bit more detail. So um, what's going on here is that, um, you know, we're doing our commit on the left-hand side um, into our configuration repo. Um, but in here, we've got our um, uh, a normal kind of Helm setup. Um, and then what happens is Flux CD comes in uh, and automatically applies that into the cluster. And we use something called the Helm operator, which pulls from that and then just does a normal Helm release. So the bottom part, you know, there's no reason to 
change the way that you write Helm. Uh, you know, the, all of that is the same as normal. It's just that the pipeline has slightly changed. So from now, Flux CD is uh, operating that on your behalf uh, rather than you manually doing that. So the nice part about this is it turns, uh, you know, it into a declarative system because you've always got the whole recipe set up um, and available. All right, where it fits in the toolkit. Um, so I think I've said multiple times it works with any continuous integration system. So um, that's a really nice part, it means you don't have to change any of the development setup for any uh, existing development teams. Um, it works very easily within the Kubernetes setup, so it will compose with other operators. So one of the things that people immediately ask is, okay, how am I gonna handle secrets management? And you can use this kind of setup to work with something called sealed secrets, um, but it'll work with other you know, secret setups as well. So it's very composable. It's really just forming um, the capability to synchronize between the Git repo um, and then into Kubernetes itself. So it's nice defined uh, capability, performs a very set role. Um, it doesn't handle packaging. It doesn't um, uh, handle templating. Uh, so really, you know, there's no reason to change uh, what you're doing with Helm. You can continue to write all your normal Helm charts. Uh, it also has a capability to work with customized to generate configuration if that's more, uh, more your cup of tea. Um, and it doesn't handle higher level concepts, right? So ultimately what it's doing is synchronizing what's in Kubernetes and then what's in Git. Um, so if there are higher level concepts like service mesh, which is where we're gonna talk about Flagger in a moment, um, that's where that applies. Um, so it's a very constrained project, which is um, very well understood and operates really nicely. So let's think about this in a sort of more detailed setup. So how would this look from a development staging and production perspective, right? So in development, our developer is going to write code, do normal work, and then build an image from a CI perspective. Uh, and I'm not really including here doing local testing or local development. At some point, they push that image, um, and then they update the manifest in the Git in the Git development branch, um, which uh, for the configuration repo, and then they push that new man manifest into GitOps. And then at this point, our development cluster can now run our new images. Um, so in this kind of setup, it's common that um, any new image that the developer pushes will automatically be deployed into the development cluster. So when they're happy, they're then going to you know, make it available to the staging um, period. So the way that we would operate this on staging is that essentially once the, the, the testing is complete, they then enter a pull request. Um, and then at this point, we can now enter into a normal pull request uh, in order to put it into the staging setup. So um, different companies will have different setups depending on whether that is the developer or maybe there's an SRE team or you know, another separate team that is operating that. But fundamentally, it looks like a normal pull request. You've got all of the configuration that has changed and you've got a new reference uh, to the container. Generally, that's going to be a tag um, so that you can you know, know that that new version is available. And then that can just be merged into the staging GitOps. And at that point, the staging cluster is updated with the new application and any configuration that has changed to do that. Um, I'm not going to talk about it too much today, but one of the things that's nice in this stage is that you can do a lot of things around policy checks. Um, and I think uh, in the webinar where Steve Wade spoke uh, about his system, he's doing a bunch of policy checks at this point, where, for example, they're checking to see that the Kubernetes API, um, that they're, they're fine with that. They're doing linting at this stage to make sure that everything is working correctly and it will work in their production clusters. Um, because, you know, it's not unusual. Um, you often find that people have slightly different versions in development they do in production for a variety of reasons so you might want to check that everything will actually run in your lightly production cluster um, you know as closely as possible um, all right so then we're into production um, so in a production setup, you know, more commonly um, for enterprise customers, they're not going to want to automate the deployment at that point. They might be happy that it's running in staging, but they might want to do that manually. Um, so uh, one of the nice things you can do with pull requests here is to, you know, because depending on what your Git provider is, you can do a lot of checks um, and sign and have multiple sign-offs in those pull requests. Um, 
So in this production setup, we would say that the pull request is reviewed, it might be accepted by multiple people who are now happy with the new deployment. Maybe the deployment has to happen at certain set times. Um, but whenever you know that's um, been signed off and, and everyone's happy to proceed, then the, the production cluster is updated with a new application. Um, and this is where progressive deployment comes in because uh, you, know, you might want to um, progressively deploy that new version of the software out into you know, maybe one cluster or a certain small number of clusters. You might want to progressively deploy that across regions or you know, depending on what your setup is um, and, and how comfortable you are with the speed of moving things forward. Um, so when we look at this in a little bit more detail, um, the way that um, is most common for people to do this, Flux doesn't really care how the setup um, of, the in, of the configuration repo, but the most common way that people do this is they'll have one branch for development, one branch for staging, and then one branch for production with a single configuration repo. That's normally the starting position. And then you can do merges across those different branches. That's sort of um, the way that people are most comfortable um, operating it. Although it has to be said, Flux itself does not mind. It's happy to work with branches. It will work with different um, uh, directories. You can even work on different repositories. So it's whatever you're most comfortable with, but I would say for most people, uh, you know, starting with a branch for each of their major uh, clusters um, and then operating that as a pipeline is what people are most comfortable with. Um, and because you've got different branches, um, or not because you've got different branches, but as you have different branches, that means you can have varying levels of authorization and various levels of policy checks on different, uh, you know, different stages through that life cycle. So you might, you know, uh, not allow everybody to deploy into production. Uh, you might uh, have a certain more uh, higher level of, of testing on staging and so forth. Steve, we've got a question from Jagendra. Yeah. Um, about one was, what do you mean by developer GitOps and staging GitOps and production GitOps? Does it mean three separate repos, which I think you just touched on? And then also a follow up that this looks like another approach other than trunk based development. Yeah, so um, you've got a you've got a choice about this. So I guess um, uh, you absolutely can do it using normal trunk based development and then which is really where people have directories. Um, I'm sort of recommending to people that as an easy way to do it from a, for a configuration repository perspective, that in my experience, what we've seen um, is that a branch uh, perspective is, is most straightforward for people to understand. Uh, and the most common case uh, to begin with is that people have one configuration repo. Um, you can imagine quite complex setups and we operate some quite complex setups for large enterprise customers where they might have many uh, or a variety of different types of clusters. So they might have you know, particular clusters that are focused on ML or particular clusters that are focused on e-commerce workloads uh, and they might keep those applications um, or those microservices defined in their own separate um, repositories, often separated by team. So there can be quite complex setups, um, you know, depending on business units and workflows and sign off process and so forth. So um, we work with a number of customers who are in uh, financial services where the constraints there are much, uh, much tighter. Uh, and so then they've got much more complex deployment workflows. But uh, I think for getting started with this and exploring whether this is, you know, a good choice for your team, a single uh, definition for the cluster and the workloads operating on that cluster, and then one branch for development, one for staging, or one for production for the configuration repo, I think is the, the simplest way to get started. All right. So... At this point, we can define everything, every workload which is operating within the cluster, and we have a way of doing you know, new builds and then deploying those new builds. And then depending on how automated we want to be, we can then automate the, de uh, the deployment into dev and into our testing clusters and so forth. Um, but for production, people commonly want to be a bit more cautious about the way that they do the deployment. They don't want to just change the cluster over instantaneously. They might want to do uh, a bit more kind of progressive delivery of that new version, checking to see how things are operating. Um, and there's a variety of ways to do that. So I'm going to, as the last thing, I'm going to talk through a project called Flagger. Um, so what we're fundamentally talking about here is in Kubernetes, there's a, a number of ways of doing different deployment strategies. 
Um, but essentially, when you start using a service mesh, uh, you get um, a more sophisticated uh, control over that. So, you know, what is a service mesh? Well, uh, fundamentally, it's a higher level concept and it makes it easier for you to connect together microservices. Um, and the way it does that is it operates layer seven API proxies. Um, so essentially it's proxying all of the service traffic between the different microservices that are operating on the cluster. Um, there's lots of different use cases for meshes. Um, they're, you know, a really active and developing area. Um, you, know, you can use them for service discovery. You can use them for security between services because you automatically have encryption between those services. Uh, you can use them to understand observability because since everything is talking over this system, over this mesh, um, you automatically get observability into everything that's happening. Uh, and the thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is progressive deployment. Um, so in this case, you know, there's a few different meshes out there. Um, the AWS option, which is a managed services app mesh, um, and the project that we um, you operate with that is something called Flagger. Flagger is um, focused pretty much on the progressive delivery side of things, so specific, a sort of specific use case. Um, and Flagger is basically aimed to work really easily with App Mesh. It's really easy to add this on as a capability in an AWS setup, and it's going to give you a lot more reliability and speed, and the ability to you know move fast and uh, you know recover from any problems really easily. Could, could you also talk about secret storage? Another question from the, the attendees. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so in a flux, uh, in a sort of GitOps setup uh, with secrets, um, you can either store those secrets through, you know, any one of the normal sort of secrets management systems. Um, and then we refer to, you know, we can also encrypt those secrets within the setup so that uh, they're actually stored within the Git repo. And that's sort of just down to whatever you're most happy doing. So whether you want to do that, you know, with a centralized system, which for maybe regulated customers will be something they're more comfortable with, or whether you want to encrypt those secrets within the setup, um, you know, within the service definition, right? Uh, and use sealed secrets, uh, which is something that came from the Bitnami team originally. There's a few different other options out there, but that's the one that, you know, is the probably the most straightforward to get started with. Uh, and what you're doing there is fundamentally is using public, you know, PKI in order to encrypt the, the secret actually in with the service definition. So that's the easiest way um, but you know there's lots of other secrets options out there as well uh, so flagger um, so popping back to flagger i'm just going to drop into that um, so flagger is a project it's a flagger.app um, it works actually with any of the different meshes but as i said app mesh is the one we're talking about today um, and so what it fundamentally does is it helps you to route um, traffic between these different you know between services and what we use it for here is the promotion for canary deployments right um, so what you need in order for canary deployments to work is you need to be able to shift traffic between different versions of the service um, and then you need um, actual metrics to ensure that the new service which is being deployed is successfully deploying. Um, so for this, we use Prometheus metrics. Um, and then, you know, as that service comes up, it will deploy um, if it's being successful and the metrics are showing the service is operating successfully, then it will continue to do that deployment. Now you can do this without a service mesh. So Flagger has capabilities to orchestrate Canary uh, releases with an ingress controller, but certainly App Mesh, um, you know, it gives you a layer of uh, greater control over this. Um, and fundamentally, it's a control loop, right? So fundamentally, what it's doing is you deploy a new version of the service. It then starts to gradually shift the traffic over to the new version. It's using uh, the um, Prometheus metrics to understand exactly what's happening and then as long as those KPIs are being successful it will then con continue to deploy the new version out um, but if it's not it will then actually abort that deployment and, and automatically fall back to the previous version. Oops. Uh, so this is what I was showing uh, earlier with GitOps pipelines with Flux. So on the left is our Kubernetes configuration in our uh, configuration repo. Um, and we've got Flux operating here on the uh, uh, container and then applying that directly into Kubernetes. And then how this changes with a progressive deployment setup is that we continue to have our service, but we get a new service that we define a canary service. Um, and then what we're doing here is Flux is talking directly to this 
is also talking directly to the container and then flagger takes over because it sees the new deployment um, and as it uses that deployment it uh, speaks to prometheus telling it whether the deployment is going successfully if the canary is deployed successfully then it will you know continue to do that deployment if it's not then it will roll back so as you can see it's quite a straightforward nice pipeline you know everything's got a sort of uh, key role and uh, uh, easy to use uh, so this is just it in pictures. Uh, so you know, we begin, we've got version one of our service running, and then we use Flagger to deploy our version two, and it'll start with increments of 5%, um, although you can change that. Um, and as it rolls out, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, so forth, so step three, um, you know, it'll bring up um, additional replicas depending on what you need. Um, and then in stage four, at this point, it's become 50% successful. So at that point, um, it will then automatically roll over um, and you will become 100% you know, operating. Um, but you can see that there are scenarios where that's not going to be successful. So at that point, it can actually at any point roll back to version one and it will do that for you uh, automatically at any point. Uh, so that was everything that I had. Um, any questions from... So there 